Good morning, good afternoon, good night. Official declaration of the International Cultural Research Association, ICRA. An initiative of the ICAC is the it at the origin of the creation of the International Cotton Researcher Associations in 2012. The motivation was to compensate the lack of the specifically dictated International Cotton Research Institute or program. Among its objectives, ICRA works to promote the interaction among the cotton scientists in the world. Because of close with ICAC, ICRA took advantage of several cotton conferences. The last one was the eighth meeting of the Asian Cotton Research and Development, Development Network, remarkably organized in Tashkent, Uzbekistan in 2019, under the auspices of the ICAC to formally attribute the ICRA Awards Medal to early career cotton scientist. ICRA urges the ICAC annual participants to convey their to researchers working in cotton the message about ICRA and its effort to acknowledge the contribution of early career scientists. Close cooperation between ICRA and the ICAC will materialize again during the seventh World Cotton Research Conference to be held in Egypt on October 3 to 7, 2022. After two years of delay because the pandemic, COVID pandemic, this event will provide up to date information on cotton research breakthroughs. It is desirable that the cotton researcher for all ICAC member countries be represented, particularly from the developing countries. ICRA and the ICAC provide partial sponsorship for travel for each WCRC, but additional financial support is sometimes required to reach the target of increased developing countries' participation. It is suggested that the cotton sector of the respective countries provide the needed support. ICRA is launching an initiative to promote the exchange of information in existing germplasm collections. ICRA is not suggesting exchange in ownership or rules by which gene banks are currently managed in their respective countries. The lack of information is a major reason for the current low level of germplasm exchange. The new initiative arises because some genetics material is, is preserved in various countries, but no single countries can comprehensively evaluate each cultivar under various botic and abotic stress. International cooperation is the way to achieve a more comprehensive assessment of existing germplasm. In mid-January 2021, Dr. Michel Fouque handed over the chairman of ICRA after four years in his position. Dr. Mohammed Negma, professor of fiber and cotton spinning, Cotton Research Institute, Giza, Egypt, executive committee's vice chair since 2016, has been appointed as his successor. While Dr. Eric Hickey, Horn Distinguished Professor, Associated Vice President of Research, Texas Tech University, USA, was appointed Vice Chair and ECRA Treasurer. In March 2021, the first edition of the Cotton Innovations Newsletter was published, and since then, nine issues have been published regularly. Cotton Innovation is the monthly publication for ECRA that provides current innovative information on cotton for breeder, growers, educators, manufacturers, and stakeholders in cotton supply chain. Cotton Innovation Newsletter has been alluded ISSN in March 2021. Due to the COVID pandemic, ICRA and the ICAC decided to print, publish, and distribute the research papers that were received at the beginning of 2020 in a book containing more than 70 research papers that will be distributed within a few weeks. Thinking about the future, cotton encyclopedia for each country, cotton diploma in whole cotton sciences, 
genetic biotechnology, breeding, agriculture practices, cotton ginning, cotton fiber quality spinning, and dyeing and finishing. Wish to see you next year in the occasion of WCRC in Egypt. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>
It is astonishing that Africa, which is producing 6% of world cotton, is exporting only $4 billion of raw materials and $10 billion of finished products, while they are importing $14 billion of raw materials and $11 billion of finished products. They are even unable to produce finished products to cater their own needs, while Bangladesh is importing raw materials of $10 billion, catering their entire own needs as their finished imports are only $0.3 billion and exporting more than $37 billion of finished products. Export of raw materials from Bangladesh is less than $1 billion. For developed economies, the trend is totally different. They are mostly exporters of raw materials, semi-processed raw materials and importing finished products. Just like trade values, China has no comparison in installed capacities as well. In 2019, 6.9 million short staple spindles were installed and 51% were installed only in China. Out of total 237 million short uh, staple spindles in the world, 97 million short staple spindles are installed in China, followed by India at 54 million, Pakistan and Bangladesh have 14 million short staple spindles. Only 4 million short staple spindles are installed in Africa. There are 14.5 million long staple spindles in the world, 6.5 million in Asia, followed by Western Europe at 4.1 million long staple spindles. China is again a leader with 3.5 million long staple spindles. In woven fabric production, Asia again takes the lead with 1.4 million shuttleless looms installed out of the total 1.8 million shuttleless looms, followed by East Europe with 6% share, that is just a little over 0.1 million shuttleless looms. China is again the world leader with 1 million shuttleless looms, followed by India, only 18,000, that is 1% shuttleless looms are installed in Africa. In current scenario, only those textile producing countries will survive who will adapt to the changing trade environment through a continuous process of restructuring and modernization, reduce their inefficiencies, develop new products and consolidate, particularly in the value-added subsectors. There are challenges and which provide opportunities to foster, but only for those who deliberate and find a solution with mutual consensus. Market access is by far the biggest challenge for majority of the countries. Country, countries are entering into free trade agreements or forming uh, economic blocks. This gives them an advantage over other countries. Trade agreements are currently at center of many policy debates and are likely to shape trade and economic relations in the coming years. Some of these discussions are about reversing or renegotiating current agreements, as in the case of Brexit. In many other cases, often involving developing countries, new trade agreements have been concluded or are being negotiated, including the comprehensive and progressive agreement for a trans-Pacific partnership, the regional comprehensive economic partnership between the Association of Southeast Asian nations, countries, and its major trading partners. Further trade is being restricted through placing high import tariffs, especially on finished products to develop the domestic industry. Even few have placed non advalorum duties as well. This can also be debatable as placing high tariffs on finished is an anti-export bias and also impart inefficiencies. Moreover, in many countries, the upstream value chain uh, plays any of the trade defense measures such as anti-dumping, countervailing, and safeguard on their products, putting downstream industry at a disadvantage or exports by another country. Moreover, non-tariff and technical barriers on trade are also placed to protect the domestic industry. This has restricted the trade and textile value chain could not grow as it should have been for the benefit of consumers and industry. Another major challenge is sustainability through social and environmental compliance certifications. Manufacturing countries, importing countries have their own legislation and then retail buying houses many a times all have their own compliance requirements. It is only the manufacturer who must comply with the conditions. Ultimately, the big production houses can only meet the requirement and SMEs slowly moving out. Often, it is a trust deficit between uh, the implementation of laws. Due to incidents, the retailers are also justified to have a third party audit. It is also interesting to note that the big production houses audits are conducted separately by different retailers, though at least at that level, it can be standardized. In past, the sustainability buying houses and retailers also developed programs such as Accord in which long-term buying was also assured. It is time to discuss the matter from various angles, including manufacturers and buyers. Mostly countries have established regulatory organizations to have a check. Therefore, their feedback will also be very important.
Intellectual property rights play an important role in development of fashion brands and trademarks. Real value in finished products come from establishment of brands. Moreover, IPRs has become more important with the development of e-commerce. It is a dream for every company and country to move from own equipment manufacturing to own design manufacturing to own a brand. However, the enforcement is not effective in many markets. Cost of doing business is one of the important concerns for the textile industry. In fact, there are many countries having market access, but they have high cost of doing business. Moreover, high and volatile raw materials cost, high energy prices, and recently freight charges have created uncertainty. After such a scenario, a sudden drop is normally witnessed. Moreover, over-reliance on some countries for availability of accessories and raw materials of allied industries such as chemicals and spare parts has also opened a new discussion and there need to be deliberated among entire value chain. Competition is fierce among producers to keep the market share, textile industry lobbies and get concessions from the government which is not possible for some countries. One may argue that countries may provide legitimate support the schemes, policies, and initiatives by the government may be discussed as knowledge sharing to take benefit by other countries. Textile is no, more, uh, no longer limited to traditional aesthetic products. It is now broadening in performance-based technical textile products divided in 12 categories, such as geotech, meditech, sports tech. The technical textiles can be a niche market for newcomers if information and knowledge is shared, especially by technology transfer. A lot of research has been carried out by research institutes and universities. New products, modified energy efficient, sustainable processes are developed, however, in silos. To augment and take benefit, it is important that a platform be created to take commercial advantage of such research and development. Moreover, to improve productivity, vocational tra uh, trainings on modern lines should be shared by the developers of machinery and chemical manufacturers. Maximum employment is in clothing and two to three months of training can change life of a family, especially women, a great source of women empowerment. Leading textiles exporting countries are looking to invest to take benefit of lower wages and availability of resources in other regions. No doubt textile is becoming global value chain. This will provide the opportunity that benefits of textile would be widespread. Private sector is looking for right opportunity. A country offering better infrastructure, long-term policy commitments would ultimately be the destination. Countries are also finding it difficult to diversify markets and products. They are stuck in volume-based products in cutthroat competition by reducing cost and rely on government support and subsidies. At one end, countries are looking for FDI and then talk about subsidies and support, then it is capacity utilization. The capacity utilization rates in the various segments still show significant differences between the upstream and downstream sector. For July 2021, fiber producers and spinners reported on average high rates of 79% and 78% respectively, while finishers, uh, textile chemical producers and garment producers on the other hand saw their rates at lower levels at 59%, 63% and 68% respectively. Most segments are expecting capacity utilization rates to increase slightly by January 2022. Only garment producers and finishers uh, anticipate lower rates, uh, that is 59% and 56%. Other, another important challenge is profit sharing among the various segments of the textile value chain. These are difficult topics, but ICAC would deliberate them with the entire value chain. Bone clothing, another difficult topic, the trade of bone clothing has increased from $1 billion in 2001 to $4.5 billion by 2020. But importantly, the quantities are huge. They have low unit values and import tariffs are marginal. This is hindering development of value-added sectors in many countries and within the value-added sector, it is creating issues for SMEs. But there is a social element as well. How to find a balance? It would require a lot of deliberations. Textile is a global chain, but how to become part of the global chain is a question mark. As maximum employment is in downstream industry, therefore everyone wants lion's share in it. The e-commerce is providing an opportunity even to new countries and new enterprises, especially small and medium. However, there remain challenges to establish an entire chain of distribution and warehousing. World moved from supplier to buyers driven and then to direct to store and now manufacturers to directly to consumer. Let alone in US, the online clothing sales increased from 27% in 2018 to 46% in 2020. Opportunity is there, but again, full of challenges.
Realizing the importance of textile value chain for sustainable development of cotton, ICAC has recently transformed and introduced textile as a full-time subject. Another important highlight is the constitution of Public Sector Advisory Council, comprising cotton producers, ginners, traders, textile value chain, machinery, allied industries, and lastly, brands and retailers. PSCAC will play an important role as providing a forum for entire value chain, and the idea is to discuss the challenges and bringing agreed upon positions to member governments and organizations concerned. It will also provide an opportunity to value a chain to get the point of view of backward and forward subsectors, build narrative, and governments to know the global perspective. ICAC is providing unprecedented services to cotton sector, the cotton data book, fiber consumption, demand and supply, costing, pricing, and networking across the globe. Similar to cotton, the ICAC will develop platform to share knowledge in textiles value chain, support governments to formulate long-term policies, share best sustainable uh, practices and policies. Further, ICAC will establish links with research institutes, universities, fashion houses, testing and compliance organizations. ICAC vision will be to develop a sustainable global textiles and clothing value chain comprising producers, manufacturers, allied industry distributors, and retailers to fully utilize the potential in member countries to generate maximum value addition and create maximum employment. ICAC is unique as it represents now entire value chain along with the governments to work for all. Thank you. Ms. Lorena Roy is economist for her presentation on production and trade subsidies affecting the cotton industry. Thank you, Chair, for this opportunity to present a summary of the government support to the cotton industry report. I would like to start my presentation by saying that the ICAC Secretariat followed the same procedure implemented in previous years to update the government measures report. However, in addition to that, the Secretariat also contacted several countries to discuss the programs they have implemented to support cotton industry. These interactions led us to have a broader understanding of the programs. The ICAC Secretariat was able to include additional information for some of the countries that will be reflected in the Government Measures Report. This report is available on the ICAC website in three different languages, including Spanish, English, and French. It is also worth mentioning that most of the data comes from governments. However, if information was not given by a particular country, then open source data was used to complete calculation and estimates. Our assessment of government subsidies for cotton includes different programs. Each of these support programs have different provisions and effects on the cotton sector. The information that is being presented today refers to the 2021 crop year. It is important to know that several countries have in place minimum support price mechanisms, but in some countries, these systems were not operational as domestic prices were above the MSP. As you all may know, the ICAC Secretariat began reporting on government measures in cotton since 1997-98. The Secretariat has stated that there is a strong negative correlation between subsidies and cotton prices. So in years when prices are high, subsidies tend to decline, and in years when prices are low, subsidies tend to increase. This correlation has remained fairly consistent during the past several seasons. In 2019-20, the COVID-19 pandemic negatively affected cotton demand, which in turn led, led to drop in cotton prices. The Cutlook A index declined to 71.3 cents per pound while subsidies increased significantly. However, in 2020-21, the development and release of multiple vaccines against COVID-19, coupled with the lifting of lockdown restrictions and quarantine measures, 
help the economy to get back on track, increasing the demand for commodities and supporting higher cotton prices. The cod look at index averaged almost 85 cents per pound, up by 19% from the previous season and the second highest average in the past seven years. The ICAC Secretariat has estimated that subsidies to the cotton sector reach a total of $6.95 billion in the 2021 crop year, an 18% decrease from the $8.5 billion observed in 2019-20. The share of world cotton production receiving direct government assistance slightly decreased from 70% in 1920 to 69% in 2021. The marginal drop can be explained by the combination of two factors, the increase in cotton prices and the decrease in, of cotton production. As a reference, in 24 years of analysis, the lowest level of world cotton production under assistance was observed in 2016-2017, with a total share of 44%. And the highest level was recorded in 2008-2009, with a share of 83%. A very detailed information on how government support programs work can be found in the final government measures report. So let me talk about the different programs that countries have in place to support cotton production. The Chinese government uses different tools. One of these tools is the, CV, is the reserve system which essentially operates like a massive warehousing program. China releases cotton to the market from the reserve when there is a shortage of cotton. It also buys cotton from the reserves when there is an oversupply. So what these actions do is to help to stabilize domestic cotton prices. Starting in 2014-15, the Chinese government has been providing a target price-based system, which is mainly a direct subsidy payment to cotton producers in the Xinjiang region. The subsidy is based on the difference between the target price set for the season and the average market price. In March of last year, the Chinese government announced the extension of the target price-based subsidy for three more years. It is important noticing that the target price has remained unchanged since 2016-2017 at 18,600 yuan per ton. The Chinese government also provides a direct subsidy to farmers in other provinces. However, the target price is lower it is approximately 11% of the target price given to farmers in Xinjiang. Another tool used by China to support its cotton sector is border protection through the implementation of import quotas. The objective of these quotas is to limit the access that Chinese mills may or may not have to international market. So basically, China supports cotton production by controlling cotton import volumes and values and by applying border protection measures based on quotas and sliding scale duties. The Chinese government also provides a subsidy to cotton farmers for using high quality seeds and for transportation of the cotton from the Xinjiang region where most of the cotton is produced to mills in eastern and southern China where most of the Chinese textile industry is located. The Chinese government also provides assistance to cotton farmers through two additional programs. The Agriculture Insurance Support Policy, which is a premium subsidy in crop insurance, including cotton, and the Agriculture Machinery Purchase Subsidy Policy. However, the total value of these two programs linked to cotton is unknown. 
The total sum of these programs provided to producers in China is estimated at $3.9 billion in 2021. In the United States, the government provides support to cotton producers through several programs. Amongst those programs are the Cotton Insurance Premium Subsidy. This tool protects producers against crop yield and revenue losses. The Tax Insurance Program is also another tool that the United States uses to support farmers. Stax provides Avalon cotton producers with premium subsidy, subsidies on the purchase of insurance policies that cover losses below the level generally covered by standard crop insurance policies. Another program is the Extra Long Staple Competitiveness Program, which provides a payment to exporters and domestic users of U.S. Pima cotton under certain conditions. The marketing assistant loans and the loan deficient payments are marketing tools available to producers during harvest. The marketing assistant loans program allows the producer to delay the sale of the cotton until better market conditions emerge. Another tool used by the U.S. to help farmers is the Agriculture Risk Coverage, or ARC, and the price loss coverage, also known as PLC programs. However, it is important to note that the ARC and the PLC payments are based on historical data rather than current planting aid area. So both of these programs provide income support to farmers, whether or not they are producing cotton. The sum of all type of support programs tied to planted cotton that are provided to U.S. producers was $625 million in 2021, while PLC and ARC payments reached a total of $454 million. Greece and Spain are the major cotton producers in the European Union. Subsidies provided to cotton farmers in Greece and Spain are based on three variables, a maximum area, seed cotton yields, and a reference payment per hectare. One important thing to note here is that if the cotton area in Spain or Greece exceeds the maximum base area in a given year, then the support per hectare is reduced proportionally. In 2021, the amount of direct subsidy to production in Greece and Spain reached a total of $297 million. In Turkey, the government pays a premium to cotton farmers per kilogram of seed cotton produced. In this year's report, the ICAC Secretariat also included two additional benefits that the Turkish government has been providing to cotton farmers. Those additional benefits are fuel and fertilizers subsidies. The Secretariat estimates that total subsidies provided to cotton producers in Turkey was $419 million in 2021. The government of India provides several programs to support cotton farmers. The minimum support price, or MSP, system becomes operational during seasons when domestic prices are below the MSP. Cotton is not the only crop benefiting from this system. In fact, the government of India fixes MSP for 22 crops, including rice, maize, sunflower, wheat, barley, jute, and copra, amongst others. I must also point out that in mid-November, the Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs in India approved a total of 174 billion rupees, equivalent to about 2.4 billion US dollars to reimburse the losses that the Cotton Corporation of India incurred due to the MSP procurement between marketing years 2014-15 and 
and 2021. At this point, it is unclear how losses calculations were made or what is the corresponding amount of, of subsidies for each season. The ICSC Secretariat will update the final, final government measures report once we get more clarity on this matter. The Government of India also provides a fertilizer subsidy to cotton farmers. Despite the ICSC Secretariat has been mentioning this subsidy in previous report, this is the first time that we provide an estimate of the total subsidy amount under this program that goes to the cotton sector. We are also aware of some other programs implemented by the Government of India including the crop insurance subsidy. Unfortunately, not information on this program is publicly available and benefits are difficult to quantify. I would like to point out that we will continue to improve our sources of data and put all our efforts to collect and inform about these programs. Several countries in West Africa provide subsidies for supporting farm gate prices and cotton inputs, especially for fertilizers, pesticides, and seeds for sowing. Among those countries are Mali, Burkina Faso, Senegal, Cote d'Ivoire, and Chad. It is estimated that together, these five countries provided a total support of $112 million to cotton farmers in the 2021 season. I would like to end my presentation by saying that the ICSC Secretariat makes every effort to report on the impact of all government measures when they are quantifiable. We also encourage all countries to provide data and comments to enhance the accuracy of the report. Thank you very much. I now call on Dr. Keshav Kranthi, Chief Scientist of the ICAC, for his presentation on sustainability snippets from the ICAC Cotton Data Book. Thank you, Chair, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. The ICAC Cotton Data Book was published in June this year. The data book is a comprehensive compilation of data on cotton production, processing, and trade. In this short presentation, I'll briefly describe a few snippets related to sustainability from the Cotton Data Book. The ICIC Cotton Data Book has 564 pages of numbers and graphs. It covers production practices and trade of 38 countries with data on individual states of each of these countries. The book has details on economics of cotton cultivation and production. It describes components of production practices on seed processing, planting, nutrient management, weed management, water management, insect pest management, disease management, harvesting methods, ginning, etc. The data book also describes cropping systems, fertilizer usage, pesticide usage, water uh, footprints, and much more. In this presentation, I'll be focusing on Africa plus 11 major countries, which together account for 95% of the global cotton production. As you will soon see, there's an enormous diversity in production practices across the world. This presentation deals with three pillars of sustainability, social, economic, and environmental. In the next three slides, I'll present some aspects on social sustainability. The bars that you see here represent the number of cotton growers. More than 22 million farmers cultivated cotton in 2020. And interestingly, India, China, Africa, and Pakistan host 95% of the global cotton farmers. Cotton farming provides sole income and supports livelihood especially for the 22 million smallholders in Asia and Africa. 
India, China, Africa and Pakistan also provide farm employment of 2.4 billion mandates every year. Thus, cotton farming not only means livelihood, but also enormous employment generation for millions of persons across the world. Not surprisingly, countries in Asia and Africa spend a major share of their cost of cultivation on labor deployment, which adds greatly to rural livelihood. In the next five slides, we will explore five aspects of environmental sustainability, such as irrigation water, fertilizers, pesticides, land use efficiency, and soil health. First, let us take a look at irrigation water. Irrigation water is a critical input in agriculture. Cotton in Africa and Brazil is rain-fed. 85% of cotton area in Argentina is rain-fed, and 65% of the area in India and United States also is rain-fed. Therefore, it is not surprising that these nations have the best water footprint. At this juncture, it's important to mention that a greater water footprint in some countries such as Pakistan and Uzbekistan is mainly because of the low seasonal rainfall in the cotton growing regions where cotton cannot be grown economically without irrigation. We'll now take a look at the fertilizer use efficiency, which means the quantity of lint produced per kilogram of fertilizer used. As you can see here, Argentina and Africa produced more than 39 kilograms of lint per kilogram of fertilizer used and thus have highest fertilizer use efficiency. Data also indicates that there's an imminent need for Asian countries such as India, Pakistan and Uzbekistan to focus on precision farming to increase fertilizer use efficiency. Now we'll take a look at expenditure on pesticides. Expenditure on pesticides is less in Africa, Argentina, India, and Uzbekistan compared to countries such as Brazil, Greece, and China. Now this could be because of less use of pesticides such as growth regulators, defoliants, and herbicides in these advanced countries. Now we'll take a look at land use efficiency. Land use efficiency is less in countries which harvest low yields. Interestingly, there appears to be a direct correlation of yields with, po uh, with plant population density. The average plant population density is 111,000 plants per hectare in all high yielding countries that harvest more than global average of 780 kilograms of lint per hectare. Conversely, the plant population density is lowest in Africa and India which harvest lowest yields in the world and therefore have low land use efficiency. Environmental sustainability hinges a lot on soil health. Recent research has shown that conservation tillage practices have the potential to rejuvenate soil health. Data shows that Argentina, Australia, Brazil, China and the United States are leading the way on zero tillage. And finally, in the next three slides, we will examine a few snippets on economic sustainability that deal with the cost of cultivation, net returns, and cost of producing one kilogram of seed cotton. The cost of cultivation is highest in Australia and China and lowest in Africa and Argentina. In fact, the cost of cultivation in Argentina and Africa is about one third of the global average cost of cultivation. Brazil, Turkey and Australia get the best net returns. Africa, Greece and India have low net returns. This is something that these countries must start looking at. The cost of producing one kilogram of seed cotton is lowest in Argentina. Thus, Argentina is the most efficient in cost of producing seed cotton. 
The cost of production is highest in Australia and China. To summarize, we dealt with the three main pillars of sustainability. On social sustainability, Africa, China, India and Pakistan provide livelihood to 22 million farmers. And these countries also provide employment of 2.5 billion man days. Economic sustainability, Argentina is most efficient in cost of production. Africa and Argentina have the lowest cost of cultivation. Australia, Brazil and Turkey have the highest net returns. On environmental sustainability, on those five different aspects, Africa and Argentina excel in fertilizer use efficiency. Africa, Argentina and Brazil excel in their water footprint. Africa, Argentina, India, Pakistan and Uzbekistan spend least on pesticides. Argentina, Australia, Brazil, China and USA are leading the way on zero tillage and on conservation tillage practices. Argentina, Australia, Brazil, China, Greece, Mexico, Turkey, United States and Uzbekistan have the highest land use efficiency. That finishes my presentation. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We will now receive the reports of the Secretariat. Dr. Matthew Looney, ICAC data scientist, who will present on World Cotton Market Outlook. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, delegates, ladies and gentlemen. I am pleased to now present the Secretariat's 2021-2022 outlook for the cotton market with a look at production, consumption, stock levels, and prices, highlighting our current expectation for consumption to slightly outpace production and a global stock level readjustment. We will start by looking at cotton prices for the last two seasons. The international reference price of cotton, as measured by the Cotlook A index, has risen dramatically during the 2020-2021 season and continues its rise into the 2021-2022 season. We did, however, see a 22% decrease in price of cotton during the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. On December 31st, 2019, the World Health Organization was alerted to a flu-like virus outbreak in the Wuhan province of China. On January 29th, 2020, the White House Coronavirus Task Force was formed. On February 23rd, the Italian government effectively shut down their country precipitating the next fall in prices. On March 11th, 2020, the World Health Organization declares COVID-19 a pandemic. From January 29th to April 1st, 2020, the Kotluk A index fell by 22.5%. This price fall was a direct result of the uncertainty caused by COVID-19. The price stabilized starting April 1st, 2020 and remains stable with only a slight upward trend for the continuation of 2019-2020. However, that slight upward trend continued well into the 2020-2021 season and did not relent as we entered the 21-22 crop season. The current price of cotton is at a level not seen in over 10 years. Cotton is an agricultural product and the uncertainties in production, consumption, weather, and pest pressures all contribute to the price volatility surrounding these uncertainties, not to mention the effects of a global pandemic. The high volatility in price is likely to remain intact for the remainder of the 2021-2022 season, but it is unlikely the price will continue to increase much beyond the current point. In contrast to the price volatility witnessed as a result of the global recession of 2008-2009, where prices during the 2010-2011 season hit an all-time high of 243 cents per pound. The ICAC's world stock estimates are currently at 20.46 million tons, compared to 10.5 million tons for world stocks during the 2010-2011 season. <clears throat> 
This suggests that global stocks are currently sufficient to accommodate increased demand, which is estimated to increase slightly into the 2021-2022 season. However, the high price of cotton may temper demand. We'll now look at uh, global production decreases and consumption increases in the 2020-2021 season. Global production decreased 7% in 2020-2021 to 24.3 million tons. The global leader in production, India, saw a 3% reduction from the previous season's 6.2 million tons, putting the 2020-2021 total production for India at 6 million tons. The second largest producer of cotton, China, saw a 1.9% increase in production to 5.9 million tons. The production increase is dis- this production increase is despite a 3.9 reduction in area, giving China the best yield realization in their history at 1,864 kilograms per hectare. The United States remains the third largest producer at 3.2 million tons, a large reduction of 27% from the 2019-2020 production season total of 4.3 million tons. This large decrease in the U.S. was driven in part as a result of significantly lower area harvested, especially in Texas. The area harvested in 2020-2021 season was down just over 28%. Brazil's production was down by 22%, putting production at 3 million tons. Reduction in area was again the reason for the lower production numbers in Brazil with an area of 1,371 hectares, down 18% from the previous season. Pakistan's production fell by 33% to 890,000 tons. This level has not been seen in Pakistan since the mid-1980s. The severe decrease in production was due to several factors. First, a reduction of 21% in the area was to blame for a large part of the reductions. However, crop damage from heavy monsoon rains and severe pest infestation all added up to reduce the production in Pakistan. West Africa saw a 20% drop in production to 1 million tons. Global cotton consumption in 2020-2021 season was up 13% over the previous season's disappointing 22.7 million tons. This increase was the result of high levels of post-COVID shutdown orders from mills in all of the top cotton-consuming countries. China, India, and Pakistan accounted for 16.3 million tons well over half of all cotton consumed in 2020-2021 season. Bangladesh, Turkey, Vietnam, Uzbekistan, Brazil, and the United States all posted increases in consumption during the 2020-2021 season. With lower than expected production during the 2020-2021 season, coupled with high consumption in all of the top cotton consuming countries, leaves global ending stocks lower than the previous season. However, ending stocks in the 2020-2021 season still remain above the previous three seasons prior to 2019-2020. This sets up the 2021-22 season with adequate beginning stocks to help accommodate a continued increase in mill use into the 2021-2022 crop year. We'll now look at the uh, outlook for 2021-2022 season. While global cotton consumption continues the recovery begun in 2020-2021, the Secretariat's current projection for consumption in 2021-22 is 25.63 million tons, a 0.13% decline over the previous season. China is reporting a 200,000 ton decrease in consumption from the previous season, which amounts to a 2.38% reduction. However, all other major cotton consuming countries are currently reporting an increase in consumption. Uzbekistan is reporting a 5% increase in consumption to 836,000 tons. Turkey, Bangladesh, Vietnam, the United States, and Brazil are all reporting consumption increases over the 2020-2021 season, which total 158,000 tons. While this is not enough to overcome the decline posted by China, the season is still early and consumption numbers are likely to change as the season matures. Global production is expected to increase this season by 25.73 million tons. Against consumption, production estimates at this point in the season show that supply is sufficient for estimated demand. Global production appears to be outpacing or on par with consumption at a time when forecasts for global consumption growth are increasing and global stocks are growing. Favorable forecasts for production and increasing global stock levels in 2020-2021 appear to continue to support increased demand if demand continues to hold strong. 
India leads the world in production at 5.9 million tons. This is 2% lower than last year, but still higher than China, who is currently reporting 5.73 million tons. China's numbers are down by just over 3% from the previous season. The United States and Brazil are both reporting increases in production over the 2020-2021 season. The U.S. is reporting a 20% increase in area and a 25% increase in production over the 2020-2021 season. Brazil is reporting a 10% increase in area and a 14% increase in production. The 2021-2022 crop from West Africa is expected to be at an all-time high with over 1.48 million tons. With the exception of the 2020-2021 season, this reflects a fifth season of steady growth in area and production. Benai, Burkina Faso, Côte d'Ivoire, Mali, and Togo reported expansions of planted area for the 2021-2022 season. The previous season in West Africa was plagued by, plagued by a pandemic, drought, pest pressure, and late sowing. Many of these problems have not presented in the 2021-2022 season. However, late season flooding is currently affecting Benai, Chad, Côte d'Ivoire, and Togo. It remains unclear if this will result in damage to the cotton crop for 2021-2022. Planted area in Pakistan increased to 2,100 hectares, a 5% increase over the previous season. In addition, well-timed rains are likely to boost production and yields for Pakistan in 2021-2022 season. Production in Uzbekistan is projected to decrease slightly as land under cotton is expected to be switched to other agricultural products. However, since 2016, the entire cotton sector has undergone radical reform and production of cotton is now entirely owned by private companies. It was formally controlled wholly by the state. It will be interesting to monitor how cotton in Uzbekistan progresses over the next few seasons. Turkey's area and production are both estimated to increase during the 2021-2022 season. Consumption is currently projected at 25.63 million tons in 2021-2022, a modest 0.13% decrease over the 2020-21 season. East Asian and South Asian economies are expected to continue to lead the world in cotton consumption based on volume, but growth, if any, is expected to be modest in 2021-22. Current estimates on raw cotton consumption include 8.2 million tons by China, Consumption in India is expected to remain constant at 5.7 million tons. Against major cotton-consuming countries, reliant on imports, double-digit consumption growth has been seen for several years, with the exception of the 2020-2021 season. Consumption in Bangladesh is currently projected to increase 1% to 1.66 million tons in 2021-22. In Vietnam, where consumption has been sharply increasing from 2006-2007, Consumption growth is expected to increase slightly in 2021-22 to 1.54 million tons. With supply chain chains for yarn and fabric being reported as well supplied, limited opportunities for movement are not expected to increase the flow of raw cotton upstream. However, logistical challenges, if they persist, could cause problems for countries that are reliant on cotton imports. With the exception of India and China, area under production is expected to increase in the United States, West Africa, and Pakistan. West Africa is expected to increase their area an impressive 885,000 hectares, a 36% increase over the previous season. Ending stocks for the 2021-2022 season are estimated to increase 1% to 20.46 million tons. China's ending stocks have depleted considerably since the 2014-15 season, where they dominated the global stocks. Currently, the cumulative world total exceeds China's holdings by 1.8 million tons. However, China individually holds more stocks than any one country by far. If strong demand materializes and production remains at or below the current forecast, global ending stocks could drop significantly. We'll now look at key messages and implications. The total estimated value of global production for 2020-2021 is 45.52 billion US dollars. That moved to 62.26 billion dollars in the 2021-2022 season. This increase in value of production from the 2021 to 2122 season is largely driven by the current elevated price of cotton. Which leads me to the conclusion of this outlook presentation as we move forward to find innovative and sustainable solutions for cotton. 
Production leads consumption very slightly in the 2021-2022 season. If mill use remains strong, consumption will outpace production. Global ending stocks could decline significantly. However, the global ending stocks from the previous season are sufficient to make up any shortfalls in production. Price is likely to remain elevated for the remainder of the 2021-2022 season. However, it is unlikely that we will see levels as high as 200 cents per pound again. Thank you. I will now request Ms. Parkhi Watts, Commodity Trade Analyst, for her presentation on World Cotton Trade. Thank you, Chair, and good morning, all. I am Parkhi Watts, and today I will be covering World Cotton Trade statistics. A quick overview of the last season. The previous season saw the global economy undergo an unusual slowdown due to pandemic-induced lockdowns, business closures, shipment and transport restrictions in a way that was never experienced before. As containment measures remained across countries, uncertainties grew, effectively halting the global economy and decreasing the global cotton exports to 9 million tons. Starting March 2021, the rollout of vaccines helped mitigate the public health crisis and assisted in global economic recovery. This recovery boosted consumer confidence and the slowdown in the spread of infections helped in revival of consumer demand for non-durable goods like clothing and textiles. Eventually, cotton demand revived, backlogs from the previous season and the fresh boost in demand picked up trade by a stronger than expected margin to reach 10.6 million tons, one of its highest ever experienced levels. The world cotton exports have shown a healthy growth in the last four decades, crossing the mark of 10 million tons thrice in 2011 and 12, mostly as a result of major rebound in demand post the global financial crisis, and in the previous season, mostly as a result of demand rebound after the great lockdown. For the current season, exports are estimated to remain strong at 10.1 million tons. With respect to exports by country, while the top exporters in the 21-22 season will remain the same as in the last season, there is a slight change in their shares with respect to total world exports. While US, Brazil and India may record small fall, Australia and West Africa are expected to regain some share. For the current season, it is estimated that United States will be the largest cotton exporter followed by Brazil, West Africa region, India, Australia, and EU, altogether accounting for 86% of total world exports. Within EU, the exports in 2020-2021 were led by Greece, followed by Spain, and we expect the same pattern for the current season. With respect to exports from West Africa, West African exports have grown consistently in the last decade. At 596,000 tons in 2011 and 12, it reached to 1.18 million tons in the last season. It is estimated that West Africa will have 37% higher production and 15% higher exports at 1.36 million tons in 21-22 season, reaching its highest ever experienced level. Many West African countries like Mali, Burkina Faso, Cordoba, and Bena are estimated to export higher levels of cotton in the current season compared to the previous season. With respect to world imports, global consumption in 2019-20 fell by 13%, bringing down the imports by 6% to reach 8.7 million tons. This was mainly due to near total stoppage of cotton spinning and textile manufacturing in March, April of 2020. Signs of recovery in consumption started showing in the first quarter of 2021. Eventually, 
consumption revived, and this also aided imports, reviving it by 16% to reach 10 million tons by the end of the season. For the current season as well, imports are expected to remain strong at 10.1 million tons. With respect to imports by country, the major important countries in current season will be the same as in the last season. In 21-22, imports will be led by China with approximately 2.5 million tons, followed by Bangladesh, Vietnam, Pakistan, and Turkey, together accounting for 80% of total world imports. While factory operations have revived, concerns about the spread of COVID-19's new variants and rising cases still pose a threat to the recovering cotton sector. Amongst many variables that impact trade, three major ones that have the potential to impact trade in the current season are the trade policies and trade tensions between countries, the progress of the cotton crop, and the effects of the ongoing pandemic and the supply chain disruptions. With respect to trade policies and tensions, there are some trade partnerships which define the past season and may have an impact in the current season. Partnership between Brazil and China. Brazil became the major beneficiary of tariff escalations between U.S. and China and was able to increase exports to China sharply in the season of 2018, 19, and 1920. In the next season, the U.S.-China trade deal came into force. It was likely that it may have an effect on China's imports from Brazil. However, in the last season of 2020-2021, Brazil exported around 721,000 tons of cotton lint to China, maintaining its share of around 30% in its total exports. To deepen their ties, China National Cotton Exchange and the Brazilian Association of Cotton Producers signed a formal MOU in the June of 2021. Partnership between Australia and China. China was Australia's largest export destinations in the 2018-19 and 1920 season. These exports to China fell by more than 60% in the last season. Although no tariff restrictions were put against Australian cotton, it could be as a consequence of changing market and political sentiments. Partnership between U.S. and China. The U.S.-China Phase 1 Economic and Trade Agreement that covers trade in cotton came into force in 2020 and changed the trade baskets of both these countries. The same is up for renewal in December 2021. Also, there are import restrictions in place on the cotton products from China's Xinjiang region imposed by the U.S. Customs and Border Protection over raw fibers, apparel, and textiles made in that region. These together will determine the trade between China and U.S. in the current season. Partnership between India and Egypt. Although India-Egypt bilateral trade agreement has been in operation since March 1978 and is based on most favored nation clause, last season saw India individually accounting for more than 60% of Egypt's total exports. Partnership between India and Pakistan. There was no cotton trade recorded between India and Pakistan in the last season. In the light of Pakistan's decision to suspend bilateral trade with India in August 2019. Earlier that year, India had also applied a 200% tariff on Pakistan's imports after revoking its MFM step status. Apart from this and against all countries, in February 2021, India had also imposed a 10% duty on cotton imports as a move to support cotton farmers. Partnership between Turkey and USA. In the April of 2021, the government of Turkey removed the 3% anti-dumping duty on the U.S. cotton exports, which was imposed back in 2016 for a period of five years. And this may create a shift in the trade baskets of both these countries in the current season. These are some of the many, many trade partnerships that will play a leading role in the current season. Second is the progress of cotton crop. The healthy trade numbers in the last season were aided heavily by the stocks and production. After world trade of raw cotton fell less than consumption in 2019-20, the world was left with 22 million tons of stock, highest in the last five seasons. The com this, combined with 24 million tons of production, brought up the world supply of cotton at 46.5 million tons for the 2020-2021 season. 
As the overall economy recovered, the world exports also revived stronger than expected, increasing by 15% to reach 10.6 million tons, one of its highest levels ever experienced. Similarly, for the current season, with 20 million tons of stocks and an estimated production of 25.7 million tons, the world supply is currently estimated to be at 45.7 million tons, estimating the world trade to remain strong at 10.1 million tons. The third variable that may impact trade in the current season is the ongoing pandemic and supply chain disruptions. Currently, on the demand side, economies are experiencing a revival in consumption with the approaching holiday season, higher vaccinations, and opening of activities. At the same time, markets are experiencing supply-side disruptions with growing infections on cotton-consuming and textile-supplying countries, shipping crisis, backlogs on ports, and labor shortages. The shortages of labor and shipments are forcing the textile supplying countries to incur air freight to meet order deadlines. Not budgeted in air freights, high ocean freights, planned power blackouts in certain areas, high raw cotton prices are altogether putting an upward pressure on the input cost for textiles. Even if the consignment reached the ports, shortages of port workers and truck and lorry drivers had affected inland transport in UK, US, and Europe, causing further delays. While the governments are trying to resolve these issues, it is expected that some of these issues may last way into the current season. That was all from me today. Thank you.